Hello, I'm Terry Christensen, and this is Valley Politics. Today we'll catch up on the state of our county with Supervisor Dave Cortese. Dave just started an unprecedented third consecutive term as president of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. Later, Ruth Herrera will brief us on the work of the San Jose Conservation Corps and Charter School. And then, on Where Are They Now, we'll talk with Mort Levine. Along with his wife Elaine, Mort published weekly newspapers in a dozen communities in and around San Jose from the 1950s to the 1980s. Their Sun newspapers were a crucial alternative to the Mercury News and gave voice to a new generation of community leaders. All this next on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome Supervisor Dave Cortese. Before we talk about the current uh, state of the county, let's take a look at what some of your constituents said about what they think their priorities should be for the county. Lower the property tax. It's too much for us poor people. I think the main concern should be homelessness and more housing for the homeless. Well, I think absolutely the priority for the county should be the same as the priority for the state and the country, which is to make sure that we have secure election systems. So we're advocating with the county as the technology hub of the United States to say we should move toward publicly owned voting systems that are more secure and less expensive. Well, we see a lot of people living on the street. They could probably use somewhere to go and probably some programs to help get them back on their feet. Probably drug treatment, mental health treatment. And I'm not, that's probably a good place to start. I think um, a lot of people are having trouble finding somewhere to live because the uh, rents are so high. I really think our communities need to uh, focus on reducing stress and violence in our youth uh, by, you know, and not really focus so much on their academics, but really helping them handle their negative emotions and their stress. Homelessness. We have a really severe homeless crisis in this county. We really do. Um, people are homeless for various reasons. Uh, a lot of it is mental illness, I notice. We have a lot of mentally ill people out on the street. The general conception is that they're all lazy, shiftless bums. And that's not often the situation. Very often, I notice home, uh, homelessness is the contributing factor is mental illness. Immigration reform, I think it's a big priority, but also uh, what they are doing with the homeless and all the population at large. But uh, I feel so proud of living in this county. We are very progressive compared to the other counties in the United States. So Dave, those are the priorities of some of your constituents. How do their priorities fit with your priorities as you presented them in your State of the County speech? Well, are they all voters? If they are, their priorities are my priorities. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're all voters. <laughs> Uh, you know, they're, they're raising issues that we're very much focused on right now and that I've been focused on uh, personally for the past several years uh, as board president, even before then. Um, homelessness is, uh, is something that, you know, we've taken uh, bold action on, I think, relative to uh, even other levels of government, the state and the federal government. We passed, uh, with the voters' help, a $950 million housing bond last November. Measure, measure B. Uh, measure, measure A. a measure, measure A. a yeah. um, which passed while Measure B passed, which was a transportation measure, but Measure mm -hmm. A was $950 million for housing, $700 million of which is for what uh, insiders call ELI, extremely low income housing. That really means money for homeless housing, what we call permanent supportive housing. Um, we know at the county, based on um, independent cost studies that we've done, that the 2,800 most chronically homeless individuals in this county cost us about $85,000 a year when we leave them out on the streets. That's in mental health services, mm -hmm. drug and alcohol yeah. and so forth. When we house them, um, that's, that cost figure is cut by about $50,000 per individual. Um, so, you know, we push that measure on a humanitarian basis, of course, first and foremost, and to try to make the homeless partners in uh, their own liberation. Uh, but at the same time, um, it's a good business model, and, and that's why we got a unanimous vote by the board to put it on the ballot in the first place. 
Um, and great public support for it. Great public support and support from all, what I would call all four major sectors mm -hmm. of, of the community. There was corporate individual giving from business people um, and even business people who were a little leery of it stood down and didn't oppose it. Uh, CBOs, co community-based agencies, put up the first $600,000 yeah, wow. of campaign money when the campaign started. Of course, the government was involved. We put it on the ballot and we pushed it. Um, but uh, you also had foundations uh, getting involved in a big way, and we're seeing that now across the board. Um, those four sectors um, heavily involved, and if they weren't, if we didn't have all of them, we probably would have lost that campaign. It, it was a two-thirds vote, but um, I'm told the margin difference ended up being 0.88%. It was really close, yeah, yeah really close. And took uh, uh, quite a while after the election to feel secure that it really had passed. Uh, last year when you were on the show, you reported that the number of homeless in Santa Clara County had declined from the previous year. How are we doing this year? Well, we'll know soon. Um, wow. Last year, um, the, what we call the point in time census showed a 14% reduction in overall homelessness in the county. It had been over 7,000. It went down mm -hmm. to about 6,500 last year. We do this, I'm sorry, two years ago. We do the census every two years. Oh. Uh, so the two years just uh, arrived again in 2017. They went out in the field, they started counting people. Um, I haven't seen the results yet, but uh, perhaps somebody has them. We're hoping the numbers go down. I will Certainly. tell you, um, with uh, collaboration and cooperation um, of, of Mayor Lacard in the city of San Jose, San Jose and the county um, did a joint project, um, and I was happy to work with the mayor on that, uh, focused on veterans um, to, to eliminate veterans homelessness um, in this valley. And so far we've uh, housed 617 otherwise homeless veterans through that program just in the last uh, year and a half or so. Um, by next year at this time, we wanna be able to show up on your program and say we're down to zero. All right, all right, we'll have you back. Um, what are some of the other priorities you said in your State of the County speech for this coming year? Well, we're um, very much focused on some other major county issues. Um, jail reform is one of them. Uh, we talked... Uh, Have pro we made progress since last year? We've made a lot of progress. Uh, the Board of Supervisors is now um, looking at and sort of threshing through about 650 recommendations that came from Blue Ribbon Commissions, uh, federal authorities, um, our own Human Relations Commission, for example. You, you had these last year when we talked, though. Are we actually making progress on some of yeah, them? Yeah, they were making. They they were in the process of making those recommendations. Those were submitted over uh, the course of the year to a committee that Supervisor Joe Simidian and Cindy Chavez oversee, um, and they have been going through those recommendations to prioritize the 650. They have made a lot of progress. I understand they're about a quarter of the way through, if not a little further by now, and they'll then take the best of those recommendations those that are non-duplicative um, and, and get them to the Board of Supervisors um, so we can have a final deliberation and, and vote them in. But in the meanwhile, we haven't stopped investing in the deficiencies in that jail system that we discovered right off the bat, uh, right after, actually even before Michael Tyree's death. And I may have mentioned that last time, but uh, we have uh, dramatically increased uh, the number of psychiatrists uh, who, who are there, um, the, the, the jail protocols with regard to uh, people who are at risk of suicide, people who need immediately mm -hmm. mental health, immediate mental health uh, help for other reasons. Um, we're trying and we're investing heavily in just keeping the mental health population out of the jails in the first place. So all of that is, is not only in progress, um, but, but millions of dollars have been invested already without even waiting for the final recommendations to come in. Well, speaking of millions of dollars, what's the general state of the county fiscally? Last year you, you expected at least a small surplus. How are we doing this year? So far so good. Um, depending on what happens uh, with our friends, friends in the federal government, especially in the White House, yes, uh, the Trump we'll administration. Uh, but left to our own devices, we'll have a small surplus again this year. What we're having to build contingencies for uh, our potential takeaways by the federal government. Um, and there's two different uh, theaters of action, mm -hmm. if you will, there. One yeah. of them is because uh, although the federal courts have said that the federal government itself cannot force um, local jurisdictions to detain undocumented immigrants, and this is recent published federal law, uh, the president, of, of course, uh, as most people know now, has issued an executive order saying 
detain them anyway because I'm telling you to do it, and if you don't do it, we're going to take money away from you. To put that in perspective, the county has about $1.7 billion in total, total federal money against... 28% of the... Overall about 35 percent and oh. our published budget right now is yeah. 6.1 billion dollars so to lose 1.7 billion or even to have it at risk you know casts a, a shadow over the entire budget yeah. process and we're just starting that budget process we start we do our budget every July 1st I know you know that but for your listeners uh, that means right now we're building that budget and yet we've got these threats from the federal government but it's not just that right you remember Congress um, along with some other federal actions coming out of the White House, is basically promising to reduce um, dollars for housing, um, homelessness, yeah. Section 8, what we call HUD funding. Yeah. Um, we know what just happened with um, uh, the Affordable Care Act. It's still alive, um, but that hasn't stopped um, you know, members of Congress and the administration from continuing to work on ways that they'd like to reduce the amount of funding for us uh, for various health care concerns. Our hospital alone is a $2.7 billion budget. Um, there's about a billion dollars there alone in our mm -hmm. health care system that's vulnerable to either congressional cuts or, or more executive orders. But it, if we can continue to navigate through that process, uh, so far so good, um, then uh, we'll be fine. We have a little, you know, we've we budgeted well and I think we've done but well. But you really have to make, the, make up the county budget without knowing for sure about these things because the federal cycle is on a later a later calendar. Yeah, and basically, and, well. and, and also the way the federal government works is you spend the money and then you bill them. Yeah. Uh, so the <coughs> so the reason we have to have a contingency, we'll build our we'll build our budget as right. if they're going to pay virtually everything. Yeah. But then we'll put a contingency in it and say if they're slow or they're late or they give us grief in honoring any of our invoices for things that they normally pay that they've previously appropriated. Well, we better have a little bit of money in the county budget to backfill that. So that's that's how we're operating. Uh, you mentioned the issue of enforcement of immigration law. Is Santa Clara County a sanctuary county? Well, nobody seems to know, uh, in, including the director of Homeland Security. You know, he was asked recently, what's the definition of a sanctuary city? And he said, uh, I have no idea. Um, that was really a kind of a contrived term. Yeah. I, I don't mind the term. I kind of like it. But it was, it was mostly invented by media folks and others that were looking for a quick way to describe counties that... Um, that lack cooperation in one way or another with with uh, ICE and with deportation efforts, uh, and not any two counties are the same, and certainly not any two cities are the same that I know of. They all handle things a little differently. What we have in common here with our biggest city, San Jose, is our sheriff's deputies do not uh, ask for status, uh, uh, immigration status information on, on routine traffic stops or in, in any other encounters with members of the public. What if they're holding somebody in jail? And I says, that person is here illegally. Please continue to hold them until we can come and collect them. Well, the federal courts, we've, we haven't done that since 2010. And shortly after we stopped, um, several other jurisdictions in the country, including Portland, for example, were, were sued for doing that, for following that request by ICE. Uh, listeners should know, when ICE tells you that, please hold this person, Yeah, it's actually a request. It means, please hold this person. It's not a mandate They don't or have legal order. authority. They have no legal authority, nor do they give us a warrant. They just ask us to do it. As a and what, and what, happened, <laughs> what happened when uh, civil rights groups started suing some of the jurisdictions that were holding people without due process and without probable cause, other than this ICE request, um, is big... Uh, damages were awarded by the courts, uh, and the courts said it's unconstitutional to do that. The Constitution doesn't say citizens have the right to due process. It says persons have the right to due process. So it means if someone's here on vacation from Europe <laughs> and they get pulled over on a traffic stop, you can't just hold them for six months because they're a non-citizen. They're still entitled to due process. Mm -hmm. and, and for some reason, that basic constitutional principle has escaped uh, the President of the United States and the Attorney General of the United States. And, and that's just a fact. That's not a political statement. I would just tell people whether you voted for President Trump or not, um, the way they're going about this right now is, is altogether wrong. Um, and it will hurt local taxpayers um, if they continue to try to coerce us uh, to, to bend the rules of the Constitution of the United States uh, in order to facilitate their deportation policy. So we're almost out of time, but last question has to be, it's good for government to have stable leadership. 
you're just starting an unprecedented third term as president of the County Board of Supervisors. How did that come about and would it be better if we actually just elected somebody to be president of the Board of Supervisors for, or mayor of the county for, for a four-year term? I, I guess, you know, there's pros and cons to electing somebody countywide, but we do it in a couple other areas. The, yeah. the district attorney's sheriff. elected countywide, the sheriff's elected Tax countywide, assessor, yeah. tax assessor's elected countywide. Okay. There's plenty of president. We just passed a bond measure countywide. countywide. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably a worthwhile thing to explore. Um, it certainly has given us some continuity. Um, we have Having a strong there board. For three years in a row. Three years in a row. Yeah. Three years in a row has given us some continuity. Yeah. I will say that it, it's a, it's a hard job. It's a tough job. And there's also something to be said for rotation to keep people fresh. But in the times that we've been experiencing lately, um, you know, and I I will say any member of this board of supervisors would be a more than competent um, president of the board. Um, but there's some argument, whichever one of us it is. Uh, to have them in there for more than a year so that you can maintain this yeah. continuity. Um, and, and I think it's given us credibility throughout the country, uh, you know, in that regard too. People have come to our county saying, um, we recognize that you have stable leadership and, and we'd like to speak to that. And I know that's raised our, our profile in regional politics because you play a big part in several regional agencies. Dave, that's all the time we have today. Thank you very much for being here and good luck on your third year as president of the board. Well, thank you so much for having me. Now it's time for community news with Ruth Herrera of the San Jose Conservation Corps. Hello, my name is Ruth Herrera and I'm an assistant recruiter for the San Jose Conservation Corps. The San Jose Conservation Corps is a nonprofit organization that provides individuals 17 and a half to 27 years old with the opportunity to obtain a high school diploma and paid job training. The San Jose Conservation Corps Charter School has two campuses. The Center Road campus offers students the option to go to school and work at the same time, but students are not required to work. The Burger campus is full-time school. Students need 180 credits to graduate with the high school diploma, as well as perform community service hours. Class sizes are kept small at both campuses in order to better support students, and teachers provide instruction that is relevant to students' lives. San Jose Conservation Corps and Charter School program has provided quality technical and construction skills and green building education programs for 23,000 at-risk youth throughout Santa Clara County for over 27 years. The Environmental Projects Department provides entry-level positions and partners with Santa Clara County and City of San Jose to keep the communities clean and well-maintained. The Recycling Department services more than 150 businesses in the South Bay area. The San Jose Conservation Corps also partners with the AmeriCorps program to provide our students with additional opportunities to earn scholarships for college or vocational training through volunteer work in the community. The application process is simple. You will be asked to interview and then be scheduled for a two-day orientation. Call us at 408-459-6430 or 408-639-9486 or visit our website at sjccs.org. We will be happy to help you continue your education and assist you in achieving your goals. Thank you. The Conservation Corps was a big help to a lot of people after the recent Coyote Creek flood. But now let's hear a bit about San Jose history from Mort Levine, publisher of the Weekly Sun newspapers for many years. Here's Mort. Mort Levine, welcome to Valley Politics. Thank you. So uh, you're kind of an expert on Valley Politics. You and your wife Elaine arrived here in 1954 to found the Sun newspapers. You reported on the growth of San Jose and the Valley for those 20, 20, 25 years. Uh, the, the city grew from, it was 95,000 in 1950 before you got here. It was 650,000 by the time you, uh, you uh, closed down the or yeah. you sold the Sun newspaper. Right. So what, what brought you here? Why, why the Valley? Well, it uh, was clear to me at, uh, when I was in the Navy in World War II that the West Coast was uh, about to uh, 
just uh, go wild in terms of growth because all of the millions of people who came through here from the rest of the country always vowed they were going to come back here and live. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had somehow gained a sense that when you spawned a subdivision of homes, you would spawn a shopping center, and that would spawn a newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the concept is obviously oversimplified, but uh, it's really what happened. Uh, there was a spurt of growth of the newspaper industry, which in a sense in that period, the 50s, was uh, the, still the dominant medium. Yes. Uh, and and uh, we began, uh, actually I uh, came to work and, and worked as the editor of a paper in Los Altos before we started uh. our first paper, which was in the Milpitas in the end of 1954. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, a year or two later, we began plans for expanding into San Jose and um, uh, starting with the East San Jose Sun and eventually had a ring around the center of uh, San Jose um, which had a center in those days, yeah. by the way. And uh, it became a, a thriving enterprise uh, because people genuinely wanted alternative to the rather fat and sassy Mercury of its day. The Mercury and News were the daily Mercury and News were joined together at the yeah. hip because they were owned by the same people. But back in those days, they had a morning Mercury they and an evening news. They had a morning Mercury and an evening news. The Sun papers were weekly, right? They were weekly, yeah. mostly toward the end of the week. Yeah. And then ultimately we had a couple that were twice and three times a week uh -huh. toward the end of our uh, holdings there. And what became of the Sun papers? What, when, why, when did they end and why? Well, we, we sold the entire group at the and at that time, in 1979, we had, no, 78, we had uh, 16 mastheads stretching from Palo Alto south to the southern border of San Jose, and uh, including most of the West Valley cities, which had incorporated during that period, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the East Valley cities as well. Uh, well, there was really only the Milpitas and... Uh, so uh, it it provided a, um, uh, as I say, an alternative to the Mercury, but uh, the sale went to a very large magazine publisher that thought that suburban newspapers was a growth industry. Uh, they were right in one hand, but the, uh, they didn't know how to run weeklies and that had to have a more intimate connection with the uh, people they wrote about. So they weren't very successful, and within a few years, they were spinning off some of the mastheads and ultimately sold that group. Uh, to how, a bunch how did of how did you do what they couldn't do? How did how did you make those connections to to communities that made your your Sun newspaper successful for? Well, a I think of I think because we had a dedication to. Um, uh, uh, being as local as possible within the neighborhood areas that we covered, and at the same time uh, defending these communities because it was a time of rapacious development and uh, the communities were, the residents of the communities were being badly treated and badly served by the Mercury, which was at that time in the hands of the development interests. So they were, the Mercury was rapidly pro-growth. Absolutely. Um, the growth is a good thing. Joe, right? Joe Ritter said something like, you know, uh, apricot trees don't read newspapers. Yeah, they were referring to the orchards that yes. had to be cut down to develop to yeah. develop the housing. So did you really set out to be an alternative voice to the Mercury News or did, did you uh, kind of become No, that? I think that uh, was driven really by the factors on the ground. Yeah. Um, I think we were happy to 
have developed a series of perhaps four or five uh, papers, each of which had a strong enough local base mm -hmm. that it could survive on its own. And subsequently, that's what's proved to have happened because the papers we owned at that time, like the Saratoga News, the Los Altos Town Crier, um, Milpitas Post, Milpitas Post, they're all able to survive as independent yeah. papers. Let's talk about what politics in San Jose particularly. You had several newspapers in different parts of San Jose. Uh, what was the politics of, of the city like in the 50s into the 60s? It, it was changing. It was changing rapidly. Um, uh, the development interests, you might in a sense say, got here first because they were obviously greatly motivated and... Um, uh, and, of course, there was no question that the uh, taking of an unimproved piece of property, namely an orchard, mm -hmm. and changing it into a shopping center or a subdivision uh, uh, was the makings of great fortunes. And with that driving force, it was another gold rush. And all of the business interests in the community, not all quite, but many of them, um, bought into that mantra. Um, so, but the residents who were starting to take hold and understand the mechanisms of power politically uh, started very slowly, but through it, individuals. Um, and this wasn't a partisan thing to start with, by yeah. the way. It was very nonpartisan. Uh, uh, the League of Women Voters uh, prided itself on not being partisan, and the Republicans were moderates in those days compared to today. Mm -hmm. But the, the, they grabbed uh, uh, the, the uh, you might say, the levers of power uh, and took them away from the developers. It was a battle, and it was uh, bloody at times. We'll hear more from Mort Levine next month. Meanwhile, you can catch up on previous shows on our website at createvsj.org or on YouTube by searching for Create TV San Jose. And you can let us know what you think about our show and suggest future topics or guests by email at valleypolitics at createvsj.org, on Twitter at valley underscore politics, and by following us on Facebook. And now that's all, folks. Thanks for watching Valley Politics. See you next time.